I'm a quality of life expert, scientist at Dalhousie University by training. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm a psychologist. I've done a lot of work on uh, adverse health correlates, uh, how they influence our quality of life. And for me, the most important thing about the various aspects of living that affect, of course, the soup in which the cancer is growing, for me, is the practicality of it all. So today, you'll see that we'll be talking about diet, for example, and what's the best diet. And then you'll hear Rob tell you, well, you know, those are the things that we know from science to be good for you. And then you hear Gabriella that says, okay, now let's talk practicality because there is, you know, if, when we eat, that process is about quality of life. It, it, we, we get pleasure from it. Um, and, you know, you, you have a diet that suits your fancy, you're happy. You have a diet that doesn't suit your fancy and it's really terribly and cumbersome to make. And all of a sudden, you know, that affects your quality of life. So, so, so that's, that's my contribution to all this. So I, I'm, I'm all about the patient. We're treating the patient, We're not treating just the disease. It's, it's great that we have this, those wonderful treatments to address the actual cause, but I'm more concerned with the person and the various layers that affect the person and how a diagnosis per, you know, affects all those layers and subsequently your experience of, of, uh, of the cancer journey. And I see that Rob had to step out, so I'm gonna talk for him. He's an amazing guy, Just, I can't believe I'm married to him. He's a radiation oncologist, he treats prostate cancer, pediatrics and breast. Mm -hmm. But his focus is prostate cancer. And so he does, you know, he's, he's, he's in charge of this radiation treatment. Uh, he's an amazing man. For the past 25 years, Rob also didn't just believe in, you know, dealing with a disease. He said, there's more to this. There's the person. How can we, how can we bring mind, body, and spirit, and psychology into healing? And there he is. He has a wonderful foundation that he started 25 years ago. He's given numerous talks all over the world about how to empower your body, mind, and spirit. Sweetheart, I said all sorts of terrible things about you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for the warm up. <laughs> what I, a it, nice wife you have there, Rock. She's wonderful. True. You're both amazing. Thank you, oh. thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I count my blessings every day. So <laughs> I wanted to actually start out with a quick story because I'm actually very happy that each and every one of you is attending i'm thinking to myself i wish my uncle had come to this same talk when he was first diagnosed with prostate cancer he's from saskatchewan as well he had an early prostate cancer in 1996 was treated with a, the big surgery radical prostatectomy in, in, in his late 50s i guess it was and then his cancer psa started to rise 2003 so Seven years later, his PSA starting to rise so when they know where cancer cells in the body. He got a salvage radiation treatment and it seemed to be working very well. The PSA went down again, but by about 2009 or so, six or six years later, he had to start on hormone treatment. So at that point, it's an incurable situation. And um, from there, he lived another... 10 years so he is his cancer was under control for all but maybe the last six months of that if you put all that together he lived for 23 years mm -hmm. i think had he um listened to this talk he would actually prolong his life and so no matter where you are in your cancer journey whether you we believe you are cured or not whether you have some prostate cancer cells in your body or not this talk is very important very, very important for you. So I want to take you through seven ways you can actually influence not only your quality life, we've got a quality life researcher here, but your actually potential longevity, right? So I think he could have done a lot better had he had he heard this, had he kind of conformed to this. So I'm just gonna share a screen uh, now, take you to the slides um, and so what we're going to talk about is the seven ways, but it's actually, as my wife, she's so good at this, she's going to probably give you two more than that as well. But I want to kind of go through why these things are important, why they can actually influence prostate cancer growth, and why they can influence your life in so many different ways. So that's the overview. And we're also going to make this fun. This is going to be something where you guys get to contribute. I hope you guys are ready for your chat buttons, because it's either that or you're going to talk.
Yeah, and, and also, you know, very, uh, very palpable because we are a couple too. So we understand that those dynamics and those complexities. So feel free to talk and, and contribute and, and talk talk back to us. Yeah. 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 I, I, I would make it a little bit more conversational for yeah. so. So uh, I believe in something called complete prostate cancer care. You could also call that integrative medicine. Uh, which is getting the best from the medical system and empowering yourself at levels of body, mind, and spirit beyond that spirit and socially, because we are social beings, that connection actually has an influence on our lives, but essentially, and you guys are doing this right now, you're empowering yourself, understanding what's happening, understanding prostate cancer, learning from each other. We're going to touch briefly because each of these is probably about an hour long talk or at least a half an hour long talk by itself, getting the best care from the medical system. Then we're going to go over some ways that you make this work for yourself. Like, how do you manifest mm -hmm. this, especially maybe even during COVID? And my lovely partner in life is going to talk about some of this, some of the issues around stress reduction and so on and connection. So mm -hmm. I show you the picture. This is one of my patients. Derek was still working at age 77 in the um, flower distribution uh, industry. So a, a sharp guy st still at that age, his PSA was 49. So that's very high. His Gleason score was eight out of 10. So he had faster growing cancer cells. Uh, and the decision between us was that we, he would be treated with two years of hormone treatments and high dose radiation to the prostate area and to the lymph node areas. And I had the conversation with him, Derek, you're going to get started on two years of hormone therapy. You better start taking care of yourself. You better start exercising. He was, he's the rare guy who actually took me seriously around that. He, our, our machines were running very, very long hours those days. So he'd come in for his radiation treatment at 7 a.m. And he would go to the university gym afterwards. He's doing like maybe three times a week. And then he kept on kind of doing it and kept on doing it. And then he's turning it into like six days per week. When, when there was, obviously you can see my wife and I with, with him here in years in a follow-up, but he knew everybody in the gym. He had this kind of social, social connection. He like point over at this, that woman over there, she's a university prof. She teaches uh, like Tai Chi and yeah. I have to memorize 108 moves. And, and so he was talking about all the elements. I changed my diet. I started exercising, et cetera, et cetera. His PSA bottom, he was telling me this, us the story that day that his friend hadn't done well from prostate cancer yet diagnosed at the same stage. His PSA was essentially extremely low at this point. And this is 10 years later. He's age 87 in this photograph and he's still sharp still looking good and i tell you guys to to a person the guys that i see in their 80s who look great and who are like their brains are good they're all exercising somehow and i'm not talking necessarily lifting weights but doing something okay go on with it so i believe in that combination getting the best from the medical system and you know empowering yourself otherwise so how do you get the best care from the medical system? That's it. And if we had the fuller conversation, you guys would be chatting that in. So you understand the language, you prepare for your appointments, you advocate for yourself. I want to hear one trick. I want to hear somebody tell me about their appointment that, that would help them make sure they got the best care. How did you prepare for your appointment? One trick of the trade. Maybe Rochelle, you can watch for the, the chat box for us. Um, it's gonna turn into like a three hour conversation if someone doesn't uh, volunteer something. <laughs> we got a comment that somebody actually knows Tarek and they do Tai Chi together. They that, that is, <laughs> oh, so sweet. Yeah, Govinda, yeah. what do you do? Govinda put his hand up. Perfect. Oh, but you have to unmute. I'll get. You can unmute Govinda. Normally, both of us, me and my wife, go for the uh, meeting uh -huh. with the doctor. And that... we, uh, one day before, we sit down together and make a list of questions we want answers for. Perfect. And, and also, once we make a list of questions, we try to find out as much as possible about those questions from Google or anywhere it's possible. That is wow. Knockout. That's perfect. And when, and when we come back, we make another list of answers we got from the doctor. Love it. Okay. Well, 
that's they, those are like home run answers. We'll go to Roy as the last last answer to this question. Go ahead, Roy. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I've been 16 years uh, post radical and uh, had a number of other issues. But my big key uh, when I go in for any of my appointments is I write down not only my questions, but what has transpired before uh, since the last appointment yes. or mm -hmm. the new one or whatever, um, my complete medical history. And I'm actually starting down a new road right now because of another cancer I've lived with for 16 years. We're moving into uh, exploring treatment options. And so I'm yeah. having to do that exercise right now. So perfect. That's my key. And also having my partner when it's possible, but with COVID, it's not always possible. So. Yeah, excellent. So it, to have that little summary that you kind of hand over to the nurse and the physician, it makes it more efficient for certain. I love the fact you're a asking the questions on your list. I'd also love, say you I, could, I also love the, the, the fact that they go in as a team, as Govinda said. Yes. We're a team. We're going to go in as a team because you yeah. are a team. Yeah. You're the health team. Yeah. And also because it affects her as much as it affects me. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> we, yes. This, this is the power of, you know, this, this thing, because there's so much knowledge in this group, you can bring it out and you know, kind of empower each other. So I wanted to show you um, a little system that and it may not be, it may, may be hard to see. This is a piece of paper that the guys in Quebec, the province of Quebec get that they're going to hand off to their family doctor. So if they get started on hormone treatments, they get this two page summary and it basically, they take this piece of paper and they walk it to their family physician's office and hand it over because essentially it's a way to communicate the medical issues to the family physician because they it's, it's very hard for us to go. Over. And here's the second page, which is basically all these issues that you need to understand. I'm sorry, guys, it's, it would be hard to see here. I will share this PowerPoint presentation with Rochelle. She can share it with others. And so essentially it's the other aspects, the weight, the eating habits, tobacco, stress, blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, blood sugars, all those things that you can have an influence over by understanding the medical system and what you need to do to empower yourself. So we're not going to take time to go through this, but just to say that there's that part of it is the empowerment piece is understanding and advocating and getting the best physical care possible. And as I was saying at the beginning, it's about you as a person, about your lifestyle. How do you live your, what are your preferences? Because we're all different. Because all those preferences and aspects of, of living, they're all affected. Yeah. We, all, we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a psychological bubble of our own and with layers. We're like onion. Yeah, sweet. So big picture, the reason I'm trying to push this forward because if you take care of yourself, you can actually have an influence at this level, I believe. I, I can't prove this to you exactly scientifically, but I, it makes sense. You know, the data is emerging that if you have prostate cancer cells in your body, you don't want those cells to get more mutations or changes to turn into more aggressive cells. You want your cancer cells just to kind of putter around forever. Hopefully you don't have any cancer cells in your body, but if there are cells there, you don't want to provoke them. And the reason I think about this is it was damaged. Like, why is it that prostate cancer is diagnosed in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s of men's lives? Because it took all those years for the normal cells to turn into abnormal cells. And it's the damage to the normal cells that caused that. It's the further damage to the cells that caused the slow growing cells to turn into fast growing cells. You don't want the ongoing damage, ongoing mutations. So how do you slow that down? How do you stop making things worse for yourself? Well, if it's proven that it's a, an activity prevents prostate cancer, you want to do that. So we know, for instance, that if you exercise, it reduces your risk of prostate cancer. If you don't eat red meat, it reduces your risk of prostate cancer. In the same way, if you know there's a risk factor like smoking, for instance, or getting exposed to these things, then you want to avoid those things. Or right? sitting for too long periods of time. There is a study that we published in 2020, looking at 1.5 million men throughout Canada. And what type of occupation, what type of job is more likely 
to put one at risk for prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, but I'm just going to focus on the prostate. And lo and behold, all the occupations that were either exposed to a lot of toxicity things like, you know, police officers, fire workers, firefighters, you know, because the, toxicity, they deal with yeah. fire toxicity, but also the other group was those men that were sitting down for long periods of time. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it is a risk factor. In fact, we got, we got a whole slide on this one. So what's the number one thing that you can do that I really think influences your physical, psychological health? Number one, I think exercise. Some people could argue um, diet, but exercise is num number one here. And I'm, I'm not going to go through all the kind of benefits. It's you know, your mental health, physical health, cognitive, your ability to think, function, you know, it allows you to do the things you love to do if you're kind of in shape, releases the happy hormones, allows your brain to, to grow. Okay, so, but this is the question for you guys. What are some of the tricks and tips that allow you to actually get that 30 minutes of exercise per day? How do you integrate that into your life? I want to hear either people to chat that one or somebody to unmute themselves and just say, this is what I do that really maximizes my chance of exercising. It's Gavin here. Uh, doing it in a group, I think, is key. You need, uh, you need uh, a group of people. I was involved in the survivor uh, prostate cancer exercise classes, and those are just amazing. You need to have people with you to motivate yourself. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. And long said, exercise with partner. Very good. Yes, it's same idea. Sometimes it's like, you know, you're, you have like a walking buddy or whatever, and you, you say, you're thinking to yourself, oh, I don't want to really do it this morning, but I'll do it for that person. And they're thinking the same thing. Oh, I don't want to really do it, but I do it for you. And, the, and what ends up happening is both guys go and, you know, have a good walk and feel better afterwards, et cetera, et cetera. So excellent, Gavin. So social. What other, what else, what else is helpful? Do first thing in the morning, somebody said. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and true. There's, yes. there's, some, there's some good data that says if you exercise early, especially, I mean, I run on the anxious side, right? And so if I exercise in the morning, kind of settles down my kind of nervous kind of anxiety type thing. So it makes me feel better throughout the day. And then you definitely get it in. You're like, not too tired at like five o'clock, you know, six o'clock at night. Oh, I'm too tired to exercise. So you just prioritize that. Am I on? Yeah. Am I Go on? for it, Jim. Um, uh, we have, uh, well, I have, um, I'm here, I'm here on a treatment. I've had uh, brachytherapy and radiation. And um, shortly after that, we joined a prostate cancer support um, resistance training uh, group. And that, that has proved very uh, valuable for us. It, it's, uh, it's fallen off a wagon a tiny bit at the moment because we're doing lots of outside gardening and what have you. But um, that has been excellent for us. And we yeah. try to get in a, a fairly decent walk. Um, Perfect. A few, few times a week. But it is, I agree with whoever said that. It, it, uh, my wife has joined in that very happily, of course. And uh, it's a good motivator. Yeah. Also, the good motivator is having the person from the cancer clinic check up on me. So that's a, <laughs> a very good motivator. Yes. Also, research shows that when we take responsibility for our routine, that that empowers us because it puts the locus of control from the outside to the inside. And suddenly we feel empowered. That gives us power. Look, I'm doing this for myself and I'm choosing yeah. the level that is good for me. And I'm doing it, you know, I'm doing it every day. I'm doing it my way. And that gives, psychologically speaking, this, this sensation, this feeling that uh, there are some things that I still control in my life. Yes. It's a good thing. For certain, and, and there's data that says you're less likely to die of prostate cancer. And again, I'm not sharing all the data on just that one particular one today. But, and there's the other thing we'd say is that we're, we're recognized there's the aerobic exercise, there's strength training. You know, when you when you flex those core muscles, get those core muscles stronger, you actually release kind of like happy hormones or the hormones of hope. I guess is the other way to say that one. There's flexibility uh, and there is coordination. That's the other part of exercise, right? And you want to be able to use that back of your brain to, to keep on going forward. Okay, excellent, guys. I'm, I, I'm going to keep it just rolling. So why don't we actually stand up? Everybody stand up right now just while we're, where we're here. Oh. And stretch and look away from the screen. 
can't really do this one as well because my there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Arms up into the air. Look up. Look up to the sky. Here we go. And shake it down and stretch whatever muscle needs stretching or be kind to your body in whatever way feels good. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's good. <laughs> well done, Andy. So, so there, there's basically science around this, right? If you're sedentary, and we're really at risk of that because we're connected with our laptops and watching screens and Zoominars these days. Um, but really, every hour, you need to be up for a few minutes at least. And so, does anybody have any suggestions as to how you can minimize the amount of sitting you do, or at least long periods of sitting or high percentage of sitting every day? I want to hear a tip from somebody. Hi, it's mm. William from uh, Toronto. Go ahead, William. Dead um, alarm. Good, good. I, I have, um, I just purchased one of those standing desks. Um, what are the thoughts on those? Oh yeah, home run. I, I was actually going to recommend that as the as the first thing. Is it one of those that kind of goes up and down? Well, I I, I actually have one that you kind of um, pull up yourself yep. um, yep. manually, but I've I've ordered one of the ones that uh, yep. I guess it has an electronic motor. So yep. it's yep. actually arriving arriving today. So nice. Five <laughs> out of the four boxes. So I'm waiting for that that one last box. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, so I'm looking forward. It's one of the ones that um, um, raises an electric electric motor by itself yes. so I'm looking forward yeah to that. it's a bigger desk so i'll have more room yes um i'm kind of like a i guess a, i do a lot of programming at work so i'm sitting down a lot but i do stand up maybe um a couple hours like i i couple hours standing uh, yeah maybe a few hours sitting and then yeah. another hour standing so I'm, I'm trying to do that but uh, yeah i was wondering your thoughts on that. oh just night and day i wanted to make that as the number one recommendation and gabrielle actually did buy me a desk and i'm very happy for it and what i do is i notice oh i'm feeling just a little bit stiff sitting down here that's the point where i stand up uh, and so i'm like you and the other thing that will happen to you william and anybody else who does this is that you'll get stronger in your standing muscles so you, you know as the the weeks and months go by, you'll be able to stand for longer periods of time. It would be more comfortable for longer periods of time. And we know that the productivity actually goes up if you're standing more than just sitting all the time. So thinking, functioning, et cetera, et cetera. The other one I do is, go ahead, Gabriella. What I want to say is that there's no new uh, evidence to show that mind rumination goes against exercise. So people that tend to think a lot and get caught in their thoughts and not be able to escape them are more likely to uh, have a more sedentary life than those that can be in the present moment and cut all those distractors. Because if I cut my distractors, now suddenly, you know, all my energy is freed up to, to go outside and look at the sky and look at the, you know, and, and, and do other things rather than just sit there and constantly review mentally that which has already gone by. So very important, and we'll be talking a little bit um, in a second about meditation, for example, or the power of presence, how to bring presence in our life. Yeah. Sweet. Well done. Uh, the last tip I was going to offer this one is whenever you're on the phone, stand up. So it's just like, it's like a little ritual. You can kind of think of these little rituals or set your kind of alarm for once an hour. So you're standing up for five minutes. So again, it's just something that you can do to actually make a difference uh, in your life. Okay, oops, a daisy. Um, dietary advice. Okay, so this could be an hour and a half talk. There's no doubt about it. And maybe we will come back and give an hour and a half talk sometime. But um, uh, extremely important, truly influence your all aspects of your health. So I want to hear a couple of tips, maybe. Um, so we know we kind of mostly fruits and vegetables, but I want to actually hear the tips around how is it that you actually get yourself to eat the healthy diet that you know about? Like what are, what are some ways that you can maximize the chance that you actually follow your own dietary guidelines? Uh, we have, uh, sorry, am I interrupting you? Go ahead, Jim. I, we have, uh, we do a lot of camping. As a matter of fact, we just come home for this session. Um, 
So we only pack, we only pack what we know we should be eating. So there's no, there's no straying from it. But that's, if anything, that's uh, one of our downfalls because um, we like a glass of wine or two and it kind of gets out of hand from time to time. I mean, we're not necessarily alcoholic, but uh, yeah. Yeah. but we, um, of course, uh, Gabriella would understand this. She's a Italiano, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> part of the culture, yeah. Part of the culture, but we have we do make an effort to eat a lot of vegetables and and fruits and cut back on the on the beef, um, yeah. cut back on the salt to whatever extent. But that's a difficult one. And stay away yeah. from processed types of foods. Perfect. Yeah. So I guess this the trick I would say is shop well, and so you really need to go into your shopping adventure with planning and when you're not hungry, right? So when you're maybe earlier in the day when you're not is prone to kind of do the kind of compulsive shopping because we're buying those things by the way this is exactly what rob is being teaching you can't find any cookies or any things that i really really like because the guy won't let me buy them and if i can't find them in the cupboards i can't eat them that's what he's really he's doing what he's preaching in our house it's, it's true so the the trick is if you don't buy the, the, the sugary cookies, sugary ch chips or whatever, the, you know, the, the stuff that you know you really shouldn't be eating, if it's not there in your cupboards at 1030 at night, it's really actually hard to get it, right? So that's the, that's the first trick. The second trick is if you do, you know, you do have gotten kind of a bit of a sweet tooth, so you do like to have that occasional little snack, it's really important that you put it in, a, in an area that you can't see. So like an upper cupboard that's inconvenient, because if you put it out on the counter and you're kind of walking by it on the day to day, the limbic system kind of takes over and it's a whoosh into your mouth before you can actually make a decision. So it, again, this is just like pure neuroscience as to how you kind of trick yourself into the good dietary stuff. Um, one other comment, maybe what, what, how about this? I'll show you what the diet looks like. And I want to yeah. ask you that same question again. How do you set up your life such that you maximize your chance you can do this? So I'd say big thing is chat with the expert. Each step of the way, you want to tap into expert advice one way or another. And usually the cancer centers have some nutritionists or there's different kind of resources on that side. For certain, at least half your plate should be uh, veggie or fruit, right? And the veggies do have protein. So it's not like you're compromising your protein intake. Gabrielle and I eat are vegans essentially, and I'm I'm like gained about six or seven pounds of muscle, and I'm my, in my best cardiovascular shape in about twenty years, and I think it's diet related. Um, and I'll tell you my trick for the veggies and, and fruit, and it's really demonstrated psychologically that works. We like color for some reason. You won't believe it. What happens? If you put a plate that has a little bit of contrast against your table and you put colorful veg, cut vegetables and fruit, cut a mango, cut a papaya, cut a little bit of watermelon, cut the peppers, put some, uh, you know, um, uh, carrots, cut them and put them up, uh, uh, you know, cucumbers and radishes and, and little baby tomatoes. You won't believe yeah, and, and just do, you know, go about your day as you usual. You won't believe how quickly your hand will be going there. And <laughs> before you know it, you try and, and, and you, your tummy will be filled and suddenly you don't have any craving for the bad stuff. Why? Because your belly is full and, and actually you're, you're digesting things. So you're feeling good. Your belly feels good. And you will have, soon you will have no appetite, absolutely no appetite for bad stuff be like oh who needs that let me let me see anything else on that table yeah yeah the the, the the somehow the body it accommodates and then likes likes that stuff and we are wired for the color as gabriella says it's just sorry gents stay away from the barbecue especially yeah. with the red meat and the fatty stuff um so just really try to reduce that that's very important obviously there's a the healthy fluids the sugary drinks are an easy win in terms of maintaining a reasonable weight and um, you know all the all the stuff that happens when you take that big sugar load and all the changes in the biochemistry and how it primes the cells to grow again i'm not going to take the time to explain all of it but it's just like so obvious you have to stay away from that yes less sugar salt etc increase the healthy fats there's lots of other healthy food options 
especially the cruciferous vegetables, especially that's probably anti-prostate cancer side of it, blueberries, so on. The one supplement you probably need is vitamin D, almost certainly uh, 10 months per year, um, but not, not multivitamins. And back to Gabriela's points right it's like the social connection that happens manji, manji, manji. Yeah. <laughs> you know what have a meeting with your partner if you leave alone make a list and say okay let's see what's good for me i'm gonna put those items down and let's see how can i increase my intake of those good things and decrease my 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 increase of the things i know they're not good for me i know i like them but i they're not good for me let let me have them four times a year listen I'm a quality of life expert. We're not telling you decrease your quality of life. We're telling you be you, be you, because we're all unique, okay? We understand that, but change things around in such a fashion that you increase the number of things that we know are good for you. Things like nuts, you should always have nuts on the table. They're filled with, with good oils, good oils and good nutrition. Uh, Costco sells them, you know, unsalted nuts in a little box like that. That probably, it lasts Rob and I, what would you say, sweetheart? About two months, something yeah. like that. And we eat a lot we of nuts. Sprinkle yeah. them. Yeah. So I'll tell you how we eat them. We have them. So we, we sprinkle them on, on cereal on, on the morning. O oatmeal. Uh, oatmeal. Yeah. Oatmeal, or, or we, we sprinkle them on, on a smoothie that we make. And we put them on top and we eat them with a spoon. They're delicious. They're delicious. Delicioso. Yeah. Delicioso. Omega-3 are fantastic. So, so now make a plan. Make a plan and say, you know what? I'm going to try this. And, and don't be weird. Nobody's asking you to be weird. When we say we're plant-based, yes, we are vegan. But I want to tell you, we're normal vegan. Meaning, <laughs> if you were to come to our home before we were vegan, Mm -hmm. I would serve you the same food, sweethearts, only that there is no meat, there is no fish, there's no animal product there. But my veggies, I cook them just as good as I used to before. And, and, and I don't make weird things. I don't make sausages because I'm missing sausages. Now I'm going to make sausages, you know, you know with, 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 with vegetables. They're normal, they're mashed potatoes with, with grilled zucchini, with lots of garlic, fresh garlic on top of it, and, and boiled steamed green beans with a little bit of garlic and avocado oil. Oh, and I can sprinkle some omega-3, like, like so, some nuts on top of them. So beautiful uh, uh, Mediterranean salads with, with, with greens, with radishes, with um, tomatoes and cucumbers and onions that I squeeze until all that beautiful juice is all over my tongue. <laughs> you will think... lick your fingers and enjoy it. So in other words, let's change things, but not in a weird way. Since a lot of people, they hear us talk about dietary changes and they say, are you kidding me? That's quality of life. You want my quality of life to go down. And we're saying, no, we don't want the quality of life to go down. We want to increase the quality of life and, and, and give you a diet that is juicy, that is tasty and it makes you feel good and improves the soup in which potentially the cancer might be growing nice nice uh yeah so, hungry, hungry. <laughs> so, so that's what that we're, we're turning this into a cooking show it seems so which oh, is good yes we might you know what? Uh, and, and we might actually just do that and we're going to talk to Richelle I would love for <laughs> Rob and I and I'll be just there in the background and Rob and all the guys let's have a zoom seriously let's all have a zoom meeting we'll talk to Rochelle Richelle and we'll all have a zoom meeting and we we send everybody the ingredients you buy the yeah. ingredients and we all cook together we'll have a ball we listen to some Italian music and you know do you know what nice we did that with our lab uh, the lab that. students and so Gabriela was actually like doing a cooking show and teaching and they were doing it all at home as well so ah. next next time around perhaps I just <laughs> want to quickly read the comments don't snack excellent like you're listening to your body cook your own food not process I think that's so important yeah. don't bring home the bad stuff into the house so I think we got to that one veggies with every meal even breakfast add your eggs put them into smoothies my wife and I eat only freshly made salads at least four times a week for lunch okay yeah yeah i mean this we could go on for another long long time these are all excellent excellent suggestions so okay in the name of time for everybody let's keep on powering through so shall we need a presentation on each one of those topics with those guys agreed i agree i love the um uh the point is it takes some planning and you kind of cook in bulk it can be more convenient to the freshly cut veggies there's like so many good suggestions here so great work guys
And, All and right. more things, sweetheart, just one more very, very quick thing. The atmosphere around eating is very important too. It's important to eat and not be upset when you're eating. You, you better mm. postpone if you're upset. Put, 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 put your meal aside for a while until mm. you're in a good mood. Make sure you like a candle, lit a candle. You like some flowers, go out, pick up a flower, put the flower there. Listen to some music you like. Make mm. it a celebration of your spirit, mm. you know, and stay in that person and chew your food and, and, and think positive thoughts and bring to mind good mm. times. Very mm. sweet the environment in which the eating happens. Beautiful. And because we ha can have a huge influence on those aspects so healthy I, I had I uh, had kind of skipped over maintaining a reasonable weight which actually you know is actually important in terms of the prostate cancer world as well but I'd say don't look at the number don't don't have a scale it's more about having your body feel healthy so I'd rather have you exercising and physically active than actually looking at a number and just having a number good right so if you if you take care of the dietary side and if you exercise, and obviously if you don't eat too, too much, then the weight should take care of itself. But we'll I'm so happy he thinks that way. I want to tell you, because I'm a pure European woman. There was a little bit of this here. So I'm really <laughs> happy. Keep maintaining that, honey. <laughs> <laughs> the healthy sleep habits. They used to call this sleep hygiene. And again, this is probably a half an hour talk by itself. But essentially, you can't force yourself to have a good night's sleep, but you can create the conditions in which a good night's sleep is more likely to happen. <clears throat> so you can think about what are the things that you need to avoid in the hours coming into your sleep time? What do you need to do to kind of create those routines? What do you do in the middle of the night when you kind of wake up and you're like, your mind is like thinking hard about what you need to do, solve some type of problem. And I can chat about healthy napping as well. But uh, in the meantime, maybe you guys can start um, chatting or someone could speak up and say what are some of the ways that you can improve the quality of your sleep at night yes do we have a brave volunteer Sorry. yes i was going to say my, boyd and i were both shift workers uh -huh. and the one thing that we found when we were working shift was that you modify your patterns like um if you're going to work at uh, 11 o'clock at night then you would go to bed like nine, 10 in the morning and then wake up and keep that pattern. Um, also having uh, like when, when we were working shift, we would have to make our bedroom as dark as possible, uh, make the environment cool. Uh, I like white noise. He doesn't. <laughs> I, uh, doing, yeah, doing a relaxation exercises or, or a deep breathing or something before we went to bed as well. I found that that kind of helped kind of get rid of all that stinky thinking. Yeah. And, and, then, and, yeah. and and diet is very important with that too, because if you eat the wrong kind of foods during nights on a night shift, if you're eating a, a greasy pizza at three in the morning, well, don't expect to sleep in the morning when you get home because it's not yeah. going to work. Yeah. yeah. So Excellent. Like I carry like a, a bag of fruits and vegetables and that kind of stuff. And I found, you know, for a night shift, then by the time you get done, everything settles right out and you're, you're good to sleep. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And caffeine yeah. and your caffeine intake. You have to be very careful with your caffeine intake as well. And yeah, well, <laughs> each to his own. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Boyd, Boyd's main diet for, for working shift. Okay. Was, a, a cop's main diet is caffeine, grease, sugar, and salt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's naughty. But yeah, yeah. but yeah, and caffeine intake yeah. and yeah. Uh, don't drink a gallon of water no. before you go to bed. Yeah. Right. But it's not, but also serious it's, it's you know lots of fruits and veggies and that kind of stuff you know and it uh, it seems to sell you down and you sleep so yeah well well done guys i think when we do with a sleep thing just just by themselves you guys are going to co-star with us because though that was a fantastic summary it was really really good summary um i i i'm been reading like I'm, I'm continuing trying to read and learn about these things so what i learned recently was in order to set your uh, biorhythms or your circadian rhythm when you first get up in the morning, go outside for at least a minute to look at the kind of natural light. Um, and it, you can't do that looking through a window. You actually have to get outside and actually see the full spectrum of light. And what it does, it sends a signal through your retina to this kind of spot just above the your pituitary gland. It basically says, okay, now is morning. Now I need to be more wakeful. And that will 
get you more awake through the day. And then the other thing they said as part of this is during that kind of sun setting, the kind of dimming light, go out again, just during the dimming light. Um, so that again, your eyes are picking up all the natural light and it's saying to your brain, now's the time to settle yourself down. Mm -hmm. And my lovely daughter uh, bought me some blue blocker eyeglasses, right? So because I'm a workaholic and I'm on my little computer doing my emails between kind of 8.30 and 9.30 at night, I'm actually having my blue blocking uh, glasses on so that the blue light coming from the screen is not going to kind of stim my brain to kind of wake me up again. So again, there's some really good science around what you can do to actually promote that good night's sleep. And it's worth reading and learning. And like Lori and Boyd are doing, experimenting to figure out this works for me, this doesn't work for me. I know I'm a happier person because of it. So last comments to anybody? Nope. Move on. Okay, go ahead, William. Uh, I guess the windows and, and phones have um, kind of the nightlight setting. So it yeah. kind of changes the light to more amber. Yeah. I don't know how helpful it is, but it probably is a little bit. Mm. Like instead of that bright blue light, like yeah. I put mine, mine on. Agreed. And that can be an auto setting around that as well. So there's some yeah. good technology uh, there. What I would suggest in the middle of the night is there's a couple of kind of options around this. One is you can go to a different room uh, because you don't want to have your bed associated with insomnia, or you can stay in the dark, which is what I prefer to do. Keep my kind of eye shields on and just go through the boredom of the hour or two. And then that I find gives me uh, more rest by the time I wake up the next morning. So, and I just, as a quick, um, as a quick aside, I do believe there's some good science that says if you, if you nap, it actually helps the quality of sleep that night and you wake up more rested the next day. But it's important not to nap beyond 5 p.m. and not to nap for too long. Uh, and again, each person to his own, you don't want to get into too deep um, a sleep cycle for the nap part of this. So. You know, the part that I really like about Robin, my presentations, when we take one topic at a time, when we spend a whole session on them, is that we talk a lot about our lives and how do we make those wonderful suggestions actually implemented in our lives? How, how what, what do we actually do? And it's kind of funny to listen to, you know, two people, normal people's lives and what the type of changes that we had to make to our lives to integrate all this. And so in future sessions, I think we're gonna talk more about that because we have a whole song and dance about each one of those exercise yeah. and diet yeah. and sleep. And how did we do, how did we adapt our lives? And we're two very busy people, but we adapted our lives to actually integrate all these recommendations. And there are some funny stories there to be told. Um, yeah. And, and, and I, I hope that in, in future sessions, we'll have a little bit more. It's, for me, as a quality of life expert, I like to talk about the practicality of things, mm -hmm. of how we can change things, but in a, in a way that is, it's, it's orgasmic. It's not, it's not or, as if it's organic, cold, like this, <laughs> organic, well, yeah, yeah and orgasmic, but, yeah, orgasmic but, too, but, yeah. but, but, but it's not detector, <laughs> it's not dictatorial. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Cause, cause sometimes when it is prescriptive, uh, you almost feel like it's an imposition on your life. No, right. sweetie. Yeah. Right. Agreed. I mean, we could also say that we snuggle for the last 15 minutes before we go to sleep, right? So, and that's not negotiable. We right. snuggle. Yeah. The oxytocin. I'm usually, you know, Gabriella's head is in my neck. I'm stroking her head. You think she's getting the benefit, but I'm also oh. getting the benefit, right? Because, because we're wired. We're wired for if you touch the skin slowly. It actually, yeah. your, your nerves and your skin pick that up and it releases the chemicals, oxytocin, it's anti-inflammatory, blah, 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 blah. That's a beautiful segue, hun, into you. Essentially, I think your section is next. It's around yeah, but somebody reduction. has her hand up. Oh, good. Uh, Claudette, Claudette has her hand up. Great. Yeah. I was just say, thinking that when we have an event or we're really busy and we have a lot of things on our mind, I'll make a list of things on paper before I go to sleep so that it's not, it's not continually to run through my yes. mind in the morning I forget what I, and then I get all yeah. upset. Yeah. Right, you're yeah. planning throughout the night if you don't write it down and say, okay, I've got this covered. I know yeah. it's there. I'll wake up tomorrow morning and restart as opposed to me thinking about what am I gonna say to the you know, BC prostate cancer group tomorrow? Yeah. 
and you know, re ruminating the whole night. So excellent suggestion. Very yeah. good suggestion, Claudette. And another thing that I want to say, because, you know, Rob was mentioned, I think it's so important for you, Jens, especially if you are in a partnership. So if you have a partner, if you have a partner, just to let go, my, com completely let go and feel protected and loved and wanted and, and kissed. It's so physical touch is so important be because we have so much, so many studies showing that, listen, we are wired that way. Even when you take an animal and you, and you give an animal a choice between cuddling with a wire, a metal wire or a blanket, the animal will go to the blanket. We're no different. If you're single, it's so important that you 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 uh, you, you you give yourself nice sheets and uh, things w pillows that are you know body pillows that you can put between your legs and then you hug with your whole body. There are all sorts of things that we can use to make it. We don't have to feel isolated. We don't have to you know, just completely cuddle yourself in things that make you feel at peace and safe and mm -hmm. ah, that you can let go. And for men, this is particularly particularly important yes particularly. well said do you know yeah. what and it reminds me that there was that study that showed that during covid the people who lived alone were taking longer hot showers yes because, yes because yes. of again it's it's giving you the kind Work. of um kind of nurturing feeling uh type thing anyways i'm going to put you over to gabrielle i'm glad they didn't interrupt me from the clinic so it was meant to be yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, you know, we hear, let me, let me bring the, the slides up. So I remember what I said here. Yeah. So I hear a lot from people say, you know, what's the deal about prostate cancer? Why would men be stressed during a cancer, prostate cancer journey? And this is just the phenops of the various things that could bring stress, stress things like visits to a doctor, taking orders from a doctor. And remember, we're talking about men, about you undergoing treatment, surgery, radiation, chemo, having gen the genital area, that's a very private area, examined, treated. And that's the case for men and for women, frequently being asked, how are you feeling? Frequently being asked, well, how, how is your cancer diagnosis? As if suddenly there is another entity between you and whoever you are dialoguing, whether it's a family member, where there's a friend. I mean, that can really bring a, a feeling of disconnect because suddenly you're not seeing your, a feeling that you're seeing. Yeah, it's as if there's you and then there's cancer and somehow the two merged and now you're, you're a different person than you used to be. And that can be very distressful to people. Disruption of work. And if you're the breadwinner, that's, that's a problem. The disruption of daily routine, being called a cancer patient, receiving sympathy, being the cause of concern or worry by loved ones. Now suddenly people are worrying about you, being unable to maintain normal sexual function, worry about embarrassment, about incontinence, feeling that you jumped from, from 50 to 70 overnight, overnight because of the sexuality and some of the other things, physical things that are changing. And so suddenly you're finding yourself like you're advanced in age, although you are still in the same body of a 50 year, year old man feeling unsure about how to navigate your physical and emotional needs with your partner. And so I want to tell you very quickly, if, if Rob, you could show the, the next slide. Next slide. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we have data from the US, but we have also data from Canada. So here in the Maritimes, we gave men a survey and we found that lo and behold, there is a huge issue with depression and anxiety in the prostate cancer survivorship population. So we, we, we compared men with a history of prostate cancer diagnosis with those that never had a, a history of cancer uh, and those that had any other type of cancer, but not prostate. And lo and behold, we find out that the odds ratio, the chances of having um, current depression, anxiety that hasn't been diagnosed are higher than twice, uh, between two to three times. And I'm just going to put in the chat room, you know, just so that I give you an idea. What are some of the symptoms of depression? You know, things like sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, hopelessness. I mean, I'm going to let you look over those, but those are very tangible things. And so lo and behold, we're discovering a silent epidemic of loneliness and disconnect in this population. And it's not just about, you know, men who have just received a cancer diagnosis. We're talking about people that have been at it in the survivorship journey for about 10 years. In Europe, they found the same results. Down south in, in the United States, they're finding the same results. And you might say, well, Gabriella, okay, well, you know, it's tough. It's tough for a man. And I'm saying, yes, but 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 there there is a bigger issue here because now we have evidence for Veha in 2019 showed data that shows that your your psychological state affects oncological outcomes. 
So how you feel in terms of your mood and in your, your anxiety levels, those can actually affect your physical oncological outcomes. So, so it is a huge issue. It is a huge issue. So we know now that, for instance, prostate cancer survivors place a, a greater uh, you know, burden on the medical system and then on, on the resources. And we know why. There's a, a silent epidemic that nobody really is shedding light on to do something about it. So, um, so very important issue here. Um, so what are some of the things that can help with, with stress and depression and anxiety? Rob, if I could have the next slide. Sure. If I was getting paged out to see somebody, but I think should I should I take should I project my yeah. screen just in case? Yeah, okay. yeah. If if you can become a co-host, that would be good. Okay. So I think I'm gonna share my screen. Or, or can or people here. see my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. So yeah. So there's a lot of empirical scientific data to show that there is a mind-body connection. And um, so let's talk a little bit about stress management because there's a lot of things that you can do to change how you're feeling. And it has to do with relaxation. It has to do with deep breathing. It's, it has to do with meditation. For instance, we have a prostate cancer empower empowerment program that, that we've developed, Rob and I, and we're in the middle of testing it right now. But we have already demonstrated using a smaller group of people that even 10 minutes of relaxation instructions using a biofeedback, 10 minutes a day for 28 days resulted in increasing in, in um, brain waves that are indicative of a relaxation uh, environment. And also, um, uh, led to a decrease in depression and anxiety symptoms. So very important. Meditation is important. Take the time, even 10 minutes a day to meditate. Close your eyes. Cut mind wanderings and really be in the present moment. Focus on your breath. Focus on what you're smelling, especially if you're outside sitting on your chair and bring to mind positive emotions. Very, very important. Right. Uh, what are some other things that can stop the stress or reduce the stress. Start looking for practical solutions to stay in the presence moment. When you are in, in, in present and bring presence to all your interactions, what does presence mean? Presence means I'm here totally for you. My mind is not wondering and, and thinking what I've done 10 minutes ago or what I'm gonna do 10 minutes from now. I'm really fully available to you. So that means when you touch my hand, I'm there and I'm breathing in that moment with you. So that reduces stress. And we know that it, it, may, it has a direct impact on, on your, on your well-being. Cognitive restructuring. Listen, you've been through difficult times before. This is just another situation. Start talking to you the way a grandmother would talk to you. What would a grandmother say? Well, listen, you've been through hard times. You're going through hard times again. It's going to be okay. Let's see what practical solutions can you adopt to deal with whatever situation is you have um, in front of you. Stay away from unhealthy coping mechanisms. Th things like you know drinking or smoking or now you know cannabis is free. You know uh, cannabis consumption or things that you know or sitting for long periods of time because your mind is ruminating. Right. So be become aware when you are going into mind rum ruminating and try to cut those periods of time by choosing you and saying, wait a minute, I I'm worthy. Of, of interrupting all this train of thought. Let me not give my mind power, so right? Although the person is not in front of you, you're still upset over something that happened. But when you ruminate what happened over and over again, you give that other person power over you because you bring all that stuff into your environment where that needs not be. Go outside, take a, 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 a breath of fresh air and then stay away from it. So things that are affecting our quality of life, emotional well-being, meeting your emotional needs. Find out what fills your emotion, your love tank. What is it? Is it physical touch? Is that, is that your love language? Is that your primary love language? Hmm? If, if you're single, get a pet or find ways in which you can do, you know, find ways, find out about Qigong or, or, or Tai Chi or, or methods in which you take hot showers, take baths, increase the amount of physical touch you're giving to yourself if you're single. If you're in a relationship 
and physical touch is the thing for you, then start communicating with your partner. Find out what their emotional, what their love language is and try to communicate more to them in their love language and communicate, exp express clearly that your love language is say physical touch and that you need touch. Touch is important for you. Take time to cuddle in the morning when you wake up at night. So find, you need to st start learning how to meet your emotional needs. If, if um, um, you know, um, Words of affirmation is your is how you you meet your emotional needs and and fill out your love tank. You might be need to be told, my gosh, don't you look handsome today? So find out what are your love languages. There is a quiz you can take online. If you go, um, what's my love language? Um, uh, and 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 so tr Gary Chapman uh, developed a quiz. You can find out what are your love languages. And then look for opportunity to meet your emotional needs in that fashion, of course, in a healthy way and keep your love tank to a max. Not You don't want your love tank to, to, to be depleted, right? Um, uh, so uh, acknowledging feelings, and this is particularly important for men, talking about how do you feel, but how do you really feel? And, and that's a tough one. You know, find a friend. If you don't have, start calling people that you haven't called in a long time. You know, join a support group, join a, there's so many clubs available online where you can actually talk about your feelings openly. And sometimes that might be through something else. So say you play guitar and you get together with a group and, and you know, uh, you, you're playing guitar, but really you're also talking about your feelings at the same time. Experiencing positive emotions, so important. When you're quiet and you bring presence right to to that moment you can actually start bringing to mind recall a time when you talked to a friend about something and you really knew what you're talking about recall a time when you held somebody's hand and you really mean it recall a time when you kissed somebody and you really liked it recall a time when you came in the possession of some money unexpectedly and that felt so good recall a time when your a neighbor knocked at your door and lo and behold came up with some muffins or something unexpected bring positive emotions into your life and make it a purpose do it purposefully because you're worth it and it's important and just just as we commit to other things and we give our time and attention to people sometimes that you know you know do that for you say what can i make a list what can i do for myself today to help this experience positive relationships Listen, we all have some negative relationships in our lives. Just don't give them as much time. If people constantly drag you down, if they have nothing to say except negative things, you know, you're nobody's emotional garbage. And yet we all end up in that situation. We forget to say, oopsie, stop. I don't want to listen to this. You know, I don't, this is not good for me right now. You may be a wonderful person, but right now with everything that I'm going through with my cancer, my treatments, I don't need this and find a way to communicate that or just put some distance. You are in some degree of control and bring more of the open the door to positive relationships. They say that our psychological science shows that our psychological state could be defined by the five most people we give our energy and time. Wherever your attention goes, your energy goes. Who are you giving your attention and your energy away? It's a very good question to ask, right? And actually right now, tell me, what, do you have some comments about that? <laughs> Anything that comes to mind with regards to that, that you might be doing right now? No, who are you giving your time and attention away? It's a good question, isn't it? At the bottom to you. <laughs> Touche. I would say too much time to work. Too much time to work, right. See, in Europe, we we leave first and we work second. Here, you work first and you leave second. Oh, maybe we can switch that around a bit. I would like that. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I think your advice is absolutely spot on and it's probably one of my biggest downfalls is um, fortunately I have a partner who doesn't allow too much negative thought. Um, and um, yeah, I, she's trying to control that in me. I, I, yeah. Um, yeah, it is absolutely true that it's a waste of time to be dwelling on the negative and I have to work really, really hard at that. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for uh, that. Thank you, thank you. Somebody put their hand up but I can't see the name. Glenn, um, you have to unmute, Glenn. 
Yeah. Have, okay. Thank you for that comment. Lynn Vancouver. I'm accused of being too positive. <laughs> I always look at. at oh. Things. I always. That's look wonderful. At, I always look at situations in a positive manner rather than negative. Oh yes. I see that we can't move forward unless we're looking at any situation in a positive manner. If you look at it negatively, you tend to go backwards rather than forwards. We need more people like you in the world. True. Uh, I say actually dangerous sometimes. Hmm. How so? Well, I, te I tend to not think about some of the negative things that may occur as a result mm -hmm. if we go forward in this particular situation, a situation and you miss the negatives that you should have think, thought about that mm -hmm. could be dealt with rather than just thinking of the positive side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be a slippery slope. I can see how that can happen. Whoopsie. Oh, <laughs> we re, I always refer to myself as a patient, by the way. I'm not a survivor, I'm a patient. You're a patient. Uh -huh. yes, I'm a patient. And I want to challenge you to use that word rather than survivor, because we're all patients. We, oh, that I love. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And we're yeah. at different stages uh, in our, our journey. So I like the word patient rather than survive. Mm. Because yeah. it tells you something about your struggle with the disease. Mm. You're treating mm. it in some way. You're doing something about dealing with your disease. No matter what that is, there's something. It may be a diet that you just speak, just spoke about. It may be one of the items that's being very positive about the direction that you want to go with your journey. Absolutely, anyway. absolutely. You, you, you know, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's battling cancer right now, and uh, I was commenting, and I was telling her, you know, I, I feel that she is more healthy than a lot of healthy people because her mind is healthy. It's, mm. it's, it's free of garbage. It's positive. It's it's kind and generous <laughs> and loving. And and I know people that claim to be healthy, and yet they're more sick in that fact because of the negativity, because of the mm. lack of gratitude and so on. Uh, Lori. Yes, I was going to say, uh, I want to kind of add a comment to what Len had mentioned. And there's a fine balance between negative and positive thinking. I know with, with whenever you have a negative thought, balance it out with something positive, maybe problem solve, because, you know, it, with that problem solving skills, then you say, oh, okay, I have all this negative shit, pardon me, on my plate. What can I do over here with a positive to help balance it out? So it's, it's, it's kind of that, that fine balance and knowing your boundaries and, and where, you know, what you can handle today and what you can't handle tomorrow. It's that balance. Wonderful. Yes. Thanks. Roy? Are you into Q&A, uh, hon? I'm wondering if you just stop yes. sharing screen. Stop sharing um, the screen so no. you can see people. Oh, okay. You're right. You're right. You're right. I'm still yeah. going over it, but I just want yeah. to hear from people. Yeah. 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 Um, I just want to make a comment that uh, um, that whole quality of life thing um, changes too when you, it's not just you that's on a health journey that your spouse is also on a health journey and actually hers is worse than yours at the moment and uh, and then you throw in that uh, at that time I was a workaholic so it was uh, uh, really going like crazy i mean you've used that term a few times uh with the work balance and uh, so I, I i really struggle with that but i go back to what len said uh is uh, just try to find the bright light each time mm -hmm. uh, the positive side of no matter what was going on but whether i was at one o'clock in the morning taking my wife to the emergency or just what there wasn't time for me to dwell on me um, I had to focus on someone else and so that's how I went through my journey and uh, um, I don't know everybody's journey is different yes yes no no well said well Beautiful. said and and the next thing I want to talk about um, and I'm just going to send something in the chat room again I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to use the chat room hun, at the same time and provide some more information via the chat room. So not sure how I'm doing in terms of micromanaging, but um, oh, sorry. Okay, so I need the next slide. Next slide. Here's where we were. So then there's the issue of sex and intimacy because it's yet another way of meeting your emotional uh, 
needs. And I put in the chat room, you know, there's a difference between sex and intimacy. There are various types of intimacy. And in fact, when you give people an intimacy profile, they find out very, very soon that um, they're, first off, they're, they have a unique intimacy profile. And number two is that there are, uh, from an intimacy point of view, quite diverse. There is, you know, creativity intimacy, intellectual intimacy, um, uh, recreational intimacy, there is self-intimacy, um, there is, you know, uh, emotional intimacy, there is cognitive intimacy. So there are various types of intimacy and, and, and we all engage in them more or less depending on our preferences and sex a lot has to do with you know the actual physical intercourse exchange and, and the two go hand in hand but they're also somewhat separate because you can be extremely intimate with 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 one another and experience a deep level of connection and presence and fulfillment and that will really fill out your love tank and then there is the actual sexual intimacy where we you know with our bodies we connect and we get pleasure from it and we may or may not in experience intimacy with that but 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 there is at least a physical you know urgent and and um, meeting of needs if, if you may and so it's important to learn you know how and to what extent can you satisfy your sexual needs and how what is like your intimacy profile and what can you do to increase the number of intimacy that you have in your life the amount of sharing in quality time where you intimately deeply connect with another being and you feel you feel fulfilled and you you raise your your love tank as a result of that um any any strategies that you might be using um at the moment that you want to talk about uh, in terms of you know raising your uh, filling out your love tank with various um forms of intimacy that that suit your needs how 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 are you what what are your preferences in terms of how mm. to meet those needs best i could also ask that question in other ways like yeah. what what are the things that make you happy in this life when oh. it, when it when you're connecting with somebody else like what are those mm. activities that really mm. that really kind of make you feel happy in the inside mm. Some, can somebody offer something around that you can even chat that one if you if you want we asked this same question. Uh, I forget which which audience. And someone said, "I really enjoy just spending some time with my granddaughter." Right, like whatever that whatever that play activity was uh, type thing. So, yeah, where where are you finding where are you finding that? Go ahead, Laurie and Boyd. Yeah, I just want to say that I mean it, it's kind of for the last couple of years. I mean because I got the the cancer diagnosis and then I decided to retire and then two weeks later COVID hit. So my big takeaway from all this whole COVID thing and retirement is just being able to spend time together that we haven't had in the past. So, I mean, we're just, uh, I mean, I, I know so many people that when they retire, they don't spend time together. Well, mm. I find just the opposite that now we're at a point in our life where all the missed activities that we've done, we didn't with, you know, working and kids and, and now we get to spend time with each other. And now we get a lot of time with our grandkids. So for me, that's nice. kind of a very positive takeaway from the last year and a bit. But Beautiful. But we but over the years, we've been together for almost 40, 47 years, 47 years. Wow. and we're high from high school. So. Yeah. Wow. And, <laughs> and over those years, we've grown together. We haven't grown apart. So all those things that you had mentioned, Gabrielle, in regards to uh, uh, the cognitive intimacy and all those different levels of intimacy, we've grown together with that. Mm, so and that sweet. that's your basis uh, to for, for happiness. Yeah. And, but, and our I mean, quality. We, we've gone about this for a long time. What yeah. we've used to, is to kind of help us through our relationship, but that's a whole different discussion. Oh, so. God, yeah. No, yeah. You don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what do you enjoy doing with your partner? Plan that into your day so that you're actually investing in quality time. I guess that's yeah. the... Yeah, and what one of the and, ideas? And, and we can be so creative. I mean, we can plot. Never, never stop dating your wife. If, yeah. Or you, you never, never stop dating your wife. Never stop doing things that are 
simple, but it, it is in that simplicity that, you know, we find each other, like holding hands. And um, I mean, one of my favorite things to do with Rob is, is to go for a walk. And I, he, a little, and that he knows that I, I, I particularly love when he, I, I make my, my, my hand as a fist and he, he, he holds me like this. And it's usually <laughs> a little bit cold, but it's, there's such a beautiful <laughs> feeling in that. There is reassurance in that. And you know, you're right with COVID, we were all forced to spend more quality time. Yeah. For us, and, it's riding our motorcycles. Oh, we're Har we're, we're Harley riders. Nice. So it's either I'm on the back of his bike or I'm on my own motorcycle. So mm. that is kind of our 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 kind of our super date. So. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Nice. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And and I'm sure we'll have another session where we talk about just <laughs> about sex and intimacy. I mean, I'm dying to tell you a few things here um, because I used to teach sexuality. So there is a lot to this. One of the things that I wanted to share with you just very briefly is the fact that we're sexual beings from the moment we're, we're born until we die. And so to embrace our sexuality, is a very nice thing. It's a really good thing. And I know religion has done a lot of harm to this idea of sexuality, but there are a lot of compassionate, gentle, loving, just wonderful things that you can do to fulfill your sexual desire that are not against, you know, religious norms. They're not against societal norms uh, that you can engage in uh, th that could be reinforced, particularly during, during you know, um, uh, the prostate cancer journey, particularly. Uh, and, and I think we don't do enough education and empowerment on that. You know, to teach people, how do I get in touch with my body? How do I make sure that every day I give my body something that it makes it feel seen, validated, loved, cared for, safe? How do I do that in a, in a loving, compassionate, generous, safe way? And, and social build, you know, socially and, and ethically acceptable way. Because, you know, <laughs> we're talking about things that are normal. Uh, but, but, but I think there's very little talk about that. And I, I look forward to a session where Rob and I can talk from just, you know, a couple point of view. Just what are some practical solutions as to how can we increase our level of sexuality and intimacy more, more deeply and more in, in a fun way? Uh, then there's the issue, of course, of psychological well-being. We talked about depression, anxiety, but uh, incredible help of meditation along the way. So meditation and that component where you bring your mind from a chattering mind to a present moment. That muscle, when you practice that muscle, it will help you with your diet because it will bring your attention to the food that is in front of you. It will help you in your romance because it will bring your attention to the person in front of you that is speaking now. That person is sharing 30 minutes of precious life with you. So it's going to take the mind from the, let me, you know, mind wanderings to present moment. Presence is so important. It helps in healing our psychological state, our emotional state, our social state, our cognitive state. Cognition and attention, again, back to the, the idea of meditation and, and this whole practice of learning. How do I stay in the present moment? Because I'm constantly in the past and the, and, and the future. And if you ask people, by and large, when, when, in, in what temporal moment do they feel most happy they will all tell you it's in the present moment you can't feel really happiness in the past or the future it's here e even when i bring to mind a, a, a um, you know a favorite memory from the past i experience that emotion here now now social well-being can't can't talk enough about this so important to have buddies so important to be part of a beautiful support group like the one that Richelle is putting together get together with people watch movies together via Netflix they have this party Netflix now uh, uh, you know share read a book with a friend and get on the phone and tour because of COVID right or FaceTime or via Zoom and talk about what did you think about that book or that movie Nomad Land what did you think about it so many beautiful moments there uh, roles and relationships. You know, we're not our ways of being roles. We're not our the, all those identity. We're much greater than that. And to to be able to to distinguish your presence, your spirit from from all those roles and ways of being in the world, from who you are within you, it's very important to learn that technique. Again, it is my hope that at some point we do a session just on that. How do we? How do I separate myself from my feelings, my thoughts, my ways of being? the roles that I have in my life. Um, appearance, uh, isolation, 
finances, employment, having just so, so learning how to navigate your social relationships, really, really important. Staying connected with people. Don't don't dissociate. Make sure that you have contact with people on a regular basis and people that that feel your love tank that are on the same wavelength in terms of how you think and how you feel. Very, very important component. Cognitive well-being. There is so much research to show now that our brain constantly learns how to, uh, it loves to learn and, uh, you know, with, with a mind. If we use it, we have it. If we don't lose it, you know, we, we lose it. So, so it's so important to learn a new language, learn how to play, learn new skills. Don't, don't become complacent and just, you know, stay kind of the same in terms of your cognitive engagement with the outside world and you, you know. Ponder upon life. What do you think about life? You have so much wisdom. You've been through all this life up to now, and you're telling there's so much wisdom there. Share that with a friend. Share that with somebody younger. Uh, you know, share that with somebody. Uh, exercise that muscle. You know, learn a new skill. They say to maintain a healthy brain, we need to learn a new language or learn how to play a musical instrument, learn uh, a new game that we've never played before. You know, make sure that you have people in your life of all ages. Psychological research is very clear on that. You should know people that are very young, people that are older than you, people of all various, because they bring a sense of mm, a livinghood and a wisdom and a, and a diversity that your brain craves for, your social brain, your cognitive brain, your emotional brain crave for. Uh, for. And brain gym, what, what is that? So it's good to exercise the body. Rob is absolutely right. And, and, and that exercise also helps facilitate your thinking and your decision-making. So very, very important to, um, to, to have this kind of, to think in terms of the soup in which our cancer could potentially be growing and minimize the factors that allows it to grow and, and maximize the, the, the factors that help, help us live healthier, better lives. Mm, beautiful. Wonderful. I think we should stop here, hun. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then we can answer questions or people can yes. say, say goodbye yeah. now if they want to, but, uh, or even stretch for a second. Oh yes. my goodness. Oh, <laughs> Oh, my shake God. your bones, shake your bones. Great. Rochelle, are you good for a Q&A session now? Or how, how do you want it just to roll from here? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we can open it up for questions. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, so if anybody has anything, feel free to either raise your hand or um, put it in the chat, whatever works better for you. Sorry, I was just reading somebody's comment. Yes, an orgasm is great for sleep. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Middle oh, of the night, Lord. right? <laughs> Relaxation response. So. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing about being in the prostate cancer support group. Like any, I know, any topic, I know. Any topic this is goes. the best group to be with. Yeah. Anybody have any questions? Oh, Govinda, go ahead. Yeah, I would just want to make a comment. Um, I had uh, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer about six years back, and I had SBRT treatment, and uh, everything is fine. What I found was one way to deal with is don't change too much of your normal routine just because you have this. I try to change the minimum from my lifestyle so that you have a continuity. You don't feel that you are in an unknown, unknown place. Mm, yeah. You try to live your life as much as possible as you were living it earlier. Mm. And secondly, take up something new, as you correctly said. I took up gold, which I never played before. Nice. Sweet. Mm -hmm. And after the treatment, after five years now, in fact, when I went for the treatment, it was not approved by the Canadian uh, health system. So I had to join a, um, a trial trial yeah. trial group, which is called PACE, PAC. Mm -hmm. And I found that uh, the minimum you change your routines, you don't feel too bad. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep, keep doing yes. the things you and love the, to do. 
Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's so important that you keep some degree of familiarity. Yeah. If you change everything, obviously, you find your, you can't even identify yourself anymore. So that's very, very hard. At the same time, you know, when it comes to, you know, lifestyles, if, if you have certain lifestyle that you know they're not good for your diagnosis, obviously, you need to change something. The definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. So, so, so it change sometimes is important, but like you said, not drastic change that changes yeah. everything about you, all your lifestyle. That's unrealistic and because probably highly unpleasant. Some, yeah, and you have some continuity. It's not that this happened and everything is stops you telling. It's not so. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, the balance, right? You're keeping things in balance. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, Thanks, Al, for that. But also, I think um, I think Ed had a kind of a general question. Ed, I'm getting the impression that you're running a, a prostate cancer support group, mm -hmm. and you're asking this question: How do you encourage people to be open to hearing this help when they're not asking for it? I know listening is important, but there is a way to encourage their questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I just say big picture, and, and we can have a, a kind of group discussion is. That Gabrielle and I are also um, modeling this kind of degree of vulnerability and openness, right? So when I tell you I'm suffering this particular way or I'm struggling this with this particular issue, it makes it much easier for you as a person to kind of open up and ask those questions. And then it's just like going into the difficult topics, going into the, you know, let's talk about erectile dysfunction. Let's talk about urinary incontinence. And, you know, so kind of normalizing the difficult stuff and just... Uh, and then that kind of sets that culture of, you know, we can talk about anything. And that also gives people permission to, to ask the difficult questions. Yeah. Does that, does that resonate to your Ed or what, what's. No, I think so. Uh, sharing our own vulnerability, uh, the, the, the modeling, um, uh, doing that. Uh, I, I don't think people are ready to listen to a lot of things unless they're ready to ask the questions. Yeah. And yeah. even if the question isn't vocalized, uh, for them to be able to say, uh, yeah, I am having trouble with depression. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then they may be able to ask, do I have any, do you have any suggestions? Do you have any tips? Right. But, um, yeah. So that, but they may feel too much of a risk right or maybe don't even identify it right you know, unless it's modeled and but if you just talk at them you shut it down yeah, yeah. absolutely uh, when rob and i have weekend retreats what we do um and and this is like, like you said rob this is something that you and i decided we talked before the event and we said sweetheart the only way we're going to be able to talk about those issues if we give practical examples from our life yeah. What happens when you had a hard day? You know, how do you, how do I navigate that road at getting to you when you are, when your mind ruminates, how do I, how, you know, or say, say we disagree on something. How, how do we get to that conversation of, you know, bringing intimacy in our lives? How, how do I keep the ball going as far as him feeling that he is a sexual person he's my husband do you know how easy do you know that 90 percent of all couples after the third year of being married they no longer see each other as a sexual intimate being because they stop it, it all becomes a mind game you know it all becomes a mm. so, so 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 we talk about that we talk about how for example he goes in the kitchen and when he is in the kitchen we have a kitchen that has about two meters between the <laughs> island and the, I, I squeeze his butt <laughs> or, or he touches me and we have this routine whereby we constantly if seriously if you were a little fly on the wall you say, my god look at them they, they're like are they just have they just met because <laughs> we he squeezes he touches a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there. but but that keeps the ball of flirtation going that mm. keeps telling him that he's my man mm. and that that i'm no lady i'm his wife <laughs> Dude, like the song goes yeah I, I, 
she's no lady, she's my wife. <laughs> so, so, so it's so important to keep that going. You know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's, somewhat, it's, it's, it's difficult when you have an hour like that. I mean, how can Rob and I convey in an hour what we take a weekend retreat for each topic yeah. and, and, and engage people? And it's tough, isn't it? It's, so your point is so well. <laughs> so the other one, Ed, in terms of like the practicality is um, like if you want to talk about depression, so what, what I would do if I, if I thought, was, well, let's just talk about depression and anxiety, I would, I would you know, work through stress because everyone kind of understands that we're stressed. And then what are your symptoms that you, when you're feeling stressed and have them people know physical, emotional, psych, you know, the mind, et cetera, et cetera. Then I'd say when you're depressed, how do you feel? Like, what are the things that you know when you're depressed, when you're feeling really anxious? And so that people are actually identifying their own symptoms and then as well, as you're presenting, you're saying, this is normal. This is what we humans do when we run into life's difficulties. So again, it's the idea is to normalize all of the difficult stuff, the depression, the anxiety, the, you know, stress, all the rest of it. Thanks, Ed. That was a great question. Got it. Got Excellent it question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, Len, you have your hand up? Yes, I did. I, I just wanted to mention that in the support group that I'm involved with, what I usually like to try to deal with these difficult questions, you start out with a, a simple a question that's quite common for people to discuss. And it's usually urinary and incontinence. And we yeah. always, almost at every meeting, we have somebody talk, well, what are you about these diapers? How long do I have to wear these things? <laughs> or and yeah. then somebody will say, do you have any idea how we can get rid of this thing? And then you gradually lead into the more difficult questions. And then someone who says, I'm not going to ask a question. I just want to hear what people say. All of a sudden, this fellow says, oh, can you tell me about this? Yeah. And they start getting more difficult as the yeah. meeting goes on. Yeah, excellent. And yeah. the support that we get from the rest of the people who are at the meeting are just absolutely marvelous. Yeah. Suggestions that come out, no, not one person could think of them all. Right. It's just, it's just marvelous. Agree. So that's the power of the group. I and mean, that's what's happening here right now, right? So yep. we talked about these different ideas and we had some better suggestions that we actually were going to, than we were going to actually talk about. So excellent. Thanks, Len. Power he, of the group. He goes as well. You know, I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you brought that up. It's too bad that we don't have enough time to go over that. But you know, once you learn your ego routine, gentlemen, do them everywhere. Do them in the eye because nobody knows what's happening in your pants. And, and ladies, they're just as good for us as they are for gents. You know, we're not getting any younger, we're getting older. And Kegels are such a great technique, you know, to master. Yeah. And if we can start cracking jokes at each other. Yeah, like I'm doing it right now. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, <laughs> Roy. <laughs> go ahead, Roy. Oops, oops. Um, I just want to make a comment that uh, I want to thank you both for a, a very excellent presentation, uh, uplifting presentation um, in our present circumstances. It's kind of neat. Um, you know, even though we're struggling with COVID, um, here you're sitting in Halifax and I'm sitting in Vernon, BC in the sunny Okanagan and we're connecting. And I think it's just uh, marvelous. And you've brought a really nice uh, presentation. I just wanted to make a comment. You were talking about uh, coping skills and stuff like that. And one of the things for me for the last 16 years to get the type of person I'm wired and whatnot is I'm, I'm not happy unless I'm busy. I have to be going flat out all the time. That's not maybe the normal for most people, but that's the way I am. Um, workaholic for many, many years. I am retired at the moment, and it, some days it gets a little antsy, but it's finding those things to maintain that mindset that I've always lived yes. with. Yes. So uh, that's sort of my, my yeah. go-to. Um, nice. You know, between church... Uh, yeah. Um, men's groups, uh, yeah. um, helping people and whatnot. Nice. Uh, nice. There's so many ways you can stay busy. Yeah. yeah. When you stay busy, you don't have time to focus on the little things that might mm. uh, want to pull you down. So yeah. I just wanted to leave that as a comment. So, nice. but I still appreciate your whole presentation. Thank you. Yeah. No, we are. We understand ourselves, what, you know, what makes us actually happy. And also, where do we find meaning, right? Yeah. That's, that's the other big one, right? So where do you find meaning in your activities? Yeah. I, I have to run. Rochelle, do you want to wish us well or maybe not? Maybe just the opposite. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, 
yeah, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ilya, do you, do you want to stick around for a bit or do you have to? I, I'm very happy to stick around. Yes. Okay. I don't have to go see a patient. I do. <laughs> Bless you. I know you do. Okay, guys, we will see so you see soon. I'll chat with you soon, Rochelle. It was wonderful <laughs> to be with everybody today. Yeah. Blessings. Take care.